You are a huge Broadway star. Well, she is a Tony Award winning actress and singer. Tony Award winning <laughs> actress. Adina Menzel is already a certified Broadway superstar. Adina Menzel, a Tony Award winning Broadway superstar. If you're like me and have been following Adina Menzel's career over the last 20 some odd years, you still might be a bit stunned to see how high her star has risen. Not because she doesn't deserve it, she does, but for the longest time, going back to her Broadway debut in Rent, what distinguished her as a performer was also what set her apart. Something of a far cry from the fabled Broadway leading lady. Now, after years of hard work, Edina Menzel has forged a career that is indisputable in the entertainment industry, though her success has never followed a straight line. In this episode, we're going to be looking back at Adina's career, and as a very special guest, I'm going to be speaking with Paul Wintorek, a journalist and, as many of you know him, the editor-in-chief of Broadway.com. Through over 30 years of covering the Broadway theater scene and speaking with many of its brightest stars, Paul Wintorek has been lucky enough to follow Adina Menzel's career from the very beginning, from a big-voiced breakout talent from Long Island to Broadway superstar. Let's dive in, shall we? One of the things that has always struck me about Adina Menzel's rise to Broadway stardom is that, in reality, it was never really what she set out to do. It's true, she did major in drama at NYU's Tisch School for the Arts, in the same class as Raul Esparza, which is a random but cool fact to know. But in the early part of her career, Adina always identified more as a singer-songwriter than as an actress. Her goal was to get a record deal. Through college and for the next few years after that, Adina worked as a wedding and bar mitzvah singer throughout the tri-state area. Recalling these days, she said, quote, I had to develop a large repertoire, so I listened to Motown, Top 40, jazz, all kinds of music. I trained classically, but when I heard Aretha Franklin and Etta James, I said, that's where my soul is. When not singing Hot Hot Hot, The Rhythm's Gonna Get You, and Saving All My Love For You at more first dances than you can possibly imagine, Edina performed her own music at small clubs around New York City, hoping to get the attention of a record label. Then in the fall of 1995, she auditioned for a new musical called Rent, about struggling artists in New York's East Village. Now, I think it's important to remember that at the time, Rent was just a small off-Broadway musical, playing at the New York Theatre Workshop, and Adina's auditioning for the show was purely pragmatic. There was a lull in her wedding and bar mitzvah schedule, and Rent's six-week run would help fill that time. The show's composer, Jonathan Larson, was adamant about casting untapped talent rather than polished musical theater performers. After impressing Larson and the rest of the creative team in her audition, Edina was cast as Maureen Johnson, a bisexual performance artist. Initially, the role had been conceived along the lines of Holly Hughes or Laurie Anderson, but so taken by Adina's raw talent and authenticity, the creative team decided to build the part around her, as they would for the rest of the 15-member cast. Rent's rehearsal period would see Jonathan Larson rewriting parts of the show right up until its first performance, including an overhaul of Maureen's Act One performance piece, Over the Moon. While initially feeling insecure by her lack of acting experience, Edina was put at ease by Jonathan Larson, rewriting many of Maureen's lines and allowing her to improvise the melody. In collaborating with music director Tim Weil, the three would ultimately decide on the overall shape of the number as we know it today. Larson even wrote Take Me or Leave Me, the show's Act Two lesbian anthem, expressly with Adina Menzel and Freddie Walker's voices in mind, a song that was ultimately the last he ever wrote. Jonathan Larson's sudden death from an aortic aneurysm the night before the show's premiere was a shock to the company of Rent, and from then on, the memory of his loss would forever be entwined with the legacy of the show. For the press and audiences attending the show, it created an irresistibly human story that must have been especially poignant in those first performances. I was already starting to be a Broadway journalist when, when Rent started off Broadway. I didn't know much about the show ahead of time. I lived in the West Village at the time. I always walked past New York Theatre Workshop. I remember seeing the, the, the artwork in front of the, the original poster in front of the theatre when they were rehearsing it. I wound up seeing the show I believe it was the Sunday matinee after it opened. So it opened that week before, got a great review in the New York Times. So it was kind of like very quickly, 
it was all there was already talk of what's going to happen to this show and i walked into it not knowing much about it i, I remember light my candle i remember that song coming on and being like wow this is th okay this is this is really different and exciting and obviously adina has a late entrance joanne which way to the stage and it's a very exciting entrance and I mean, look, she was everything that I loved. A big, brassy, belty, sassy, you know. I, 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 Adina Menzel immediately was right up my alley. After receiving overwhelming critical praise, the show quickly sold out and was extended at the New York Theatre Workshop before the producers ultimately announced the show's transfer uptown, leading many people to question if a show like Rent and talents like Adina Menzel had a place in the Broadway theater scene. In terms of new, original musicals, the Broadway scene had seen better days. Shows opening that season, like Big and Victor Victoria, represented the beginning of big brand movie titles becoming musicals, though credit should be given to innovative and experimental shows like Bring in the Noise, Bring in the Funk, which, like Rent, had transferred from off-Broadway. But Rent's inclusion of contemporary and timely subject matter, along with its fully integrated pop and rock score, brought a relevance to the musical theater that hadn't been seen for some time. So when Rent transferred to the Nederlander Theater in April of 1996, it really did represent the beginning of a new era in the theater, a new kind of Broadway talent, and most importantly, a whole new generation of young theatergoers. This is the show where Adina Menzel was first introduced to the world. For her first professional acting credit, she had inadvertently been cast in the biggest musical of the decade. Critics and audiences were quick to commend her big voice and commanding presence, and her performance in Rent would earn her a Tony nomination for Best Featured Actress in a Musical. At the end of 1996, Adina spoke about the whirlwind year with Rent and of gaining her coveted recording contract with Hollywood Records. Of her debut album, she described it as a funky, soulful pop record. This time next year, my dream is to be on a bus with a band, opening for someone like Lenny Kravitz at Radio City. I want to focus on my music. After departing Rent in July of 1997, Adina went right into the studio with producer Milton Davis. In August of 1998, she appeared in the Lilith Fair Music Festival, where she showcased music from her subsequent debut album, Still I Can't Be Still, which was released the following month. The songs are eclectic, covering a range of styles like soul, funk, R&B, and rock and roll. She's clearly a dynamic singer, but the album doesn't really give a cohesive representation of who she is at that time, something that would have been key to stand out in the packed music scene of 1998. The album doesn't really hold an obvious single, and even though her song Minuet did make airplay, it never broke into the major radio charts. First time I heard my song on the radio, they called it My Mute by Idina Menzel. <laughs> I mean, what was I thinking? You don't write a pop song called Minuet, except anyone who wants to 12th Avenue to know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> Following the album's release, Hollywood Records produced a rather modest promotional tour for Adina, something like a dozen stops on the eastern seaboard of the United States. In July of 1999, it was reported that she was working on a second album, but after selling less than 10,000 copies of her debut effort, Hollywood Records ultimately decided to drop Adina from the label. Obviously, this would have been incredibly devastating for Adina. But fortunately for her, there was already a community that had embraced her. So, in March of 2000, Adina returned to the New York stage in Andrew Lippa's new off-Broadway musical, The Wild Party. Set in Prohibition-era New York, Adina played the cocaine-addled lush, Kate, getting to sing arguably the show's best-known song, The Life of the Party. But unlike Rent, Andrew Lippa's The Wild Party was not a critical success. In fact, Ben Brentley of the New York Times, who had lauded Rent and Adina's performance in his 1996 review, panned the show, even making a point to call Adina loud, shrill, and hyper-intense. After The Wild Party, she continued to write and showcase her music at clubs like Joe's Pub and The Cutting Room. Music is not too fast, but theater community is like embracing and warm, and they're just, they're just so supportive. 
But after two years away to focus on her music career, Edina basically had to reestablish herself in the theater community. She did kind of have to find her footing in the theater world because the cast of Rent, they were unusual talents. And I don't think that the theater industry is always great at figuring out what to do with people that aren't sort of the classic Broadway, they don't fit the classic Broadway mold. So I remember that Adina Menzel had a parent, I wish I saw it, I didn't see it, but I know that she had a work session to be in Thoroughly Modern Millie. She did a musical called Summer of 42 at Good Speed that I saw where she was a blonde and she did Aida. But it wasn't like Broadway was immediately like, um, here, here's your, here's your next big thing. We're very excited about you. And then came Wicked, a musical adaptation of Gregory Maguire's novel telling the untold story of the Witches of Oz. Wicked had previously been workshopped on the West Coast with Broadway's Christian Chenoweth and a then unknown Stephanie J. Block. In anticipation for a New York reading set for December 2001, the producers of Wicked decided to audition actresses with Broadway credits for the role of Elphaba. Edina was eager to work with the creative team, and after reading the novel, she decided to dress the part for her first impression. I guess it was kind of crazy, but I just wanted to give a nod to the character for the audition, so I wore green eyeshadow and some green lipstick, and made myself look kind of dreary. Smoky eyes, dark, ratty clothes to feel grungy. That's how I saw Elphaba after I read the novel. Edina was the first person to audition for the workshop, and the creative team was immediately taken with her. She was later called back to sing the show's Act 1 finale, Defying Gravity, and famously, while singing the song's finale, cracked on the high note, to which she promptly swore at the top of her voice, and at the next attempt, hit the note perfectly. The team was nevertheless impressed. The show's director, Joe Mantello, said the moment made Adina all the more endearing, and shortly thereafter was offered the part. Following the successful December reading, Adina and Kristen were locked in, working with the writers through several workshops and readings. Like her experience with Rent, it was a unique opportunity to have a role written around Adina's talents. After a tryout production in San Francisco, Wicked opened on Broadway in October 2003, as I talked about in the very first episode I ever did on this channel, which feels like a lifetime ago, the show opened to mixed reviews but became a bona fide hit through wildly enthusiastic audiences and word of mouth. Now, we obviously know that Wicked is very important to Adina Menzel's career, but things can get conflated over the years, so we may forget that when the show first opened, Adina's performance in Wicked was overshadowed by Kristen Chenoweth, at least critically speaking. It was fascinating to watch the Kristen Chenoweth, Adina Menzel sort of dynamic when Wicked came along because Kristen was immediately the most loved, you know, talent on Broadway, music, musical talent. She had a huge moment four years prior to Wicked with You're Gonna Man Charlie Brown, won a Tony Award, and she got a sitcom. She was the opposite of the Rent cast. She was very easy for Broadway to say, we know exactly what to do with a hilarious blonde who can sing. I mean, you know, it, she was, she fit the mold. Adina was not that. Adina was the girl from Rent that probably didn't have the respect that I thought, she, I knew she deserved from the, from the get-go. Kristen, critics automatically wanted to love everything she did. And Adina, they kind of acted like she was just this, this sidekick character and they reviewed her like they had to review her. And it was, it was strange to watch that happen because for an audience member or for anyone who is able to look beyond the default sort of Broadway thinking, it was very confusing because it's, it's a very equal show, if not Alphabet's story. This kind of discourse only fueled speculation of a supposedly adversary relationship between Kristen and Adina, which, honestly, I don't think there's much to, though the press and the public have continued to prod at the subject. In interviews, they've always been cordial and have time and time again expressed a mutual respect for one another. Of their pairing, Joe Mantello would say, Adina is so original and ethereal, kind of a mess in a really great way. 
It makes her the perfect counterpoint in how solid Kristen is. They had incredible chemistry from the very first day until Kristen left the show. Their onstage chemistry was remarkable, and even though offstage they are very different people, when they get together, to me, it was magical. So, in episode one, I talked about the 2004 Tony race for Best Musical. Avenue Q! But today, we're going to be talking about the Best Leading Actress category this year. For Wicked, both Kristen and Adina would receive nominations, along with Stephanie DeBruzzo in Avenue Q, Donna Murphy in Wonderful Town, and Tanya Pinkins for Carolina Change. All insiders agreed that this was the most competitive category of the year, with every actress delivering standout performances. In anticipation of the evening and predicting who would win, the critics saw this category as the old pros versus the new pros. Most critics seem to have written off Stephanie DeBruzzo's chances altogether, in spite of her dynamic and multifaceted performance. Speculation was that Kristen and Adina would split the vote and cancel each other out, and that the race was really between Donna Murphy and Tanya Pinkins. A New York Times article by Jesse McKinley, though, gives for me the most comprehensive analysis of the race that year. While Donna Murphy was, is, well-respected in the community, and did garner excellent notices for her work in Wonderful Town, she had sustained an injury during previews of the show, later revealed to be a vocal hemorrhage, and her frequent absences from the show were largely held against her favor. With Christian Chenoweth, McKinley shares that he thought that Glinda wasn't actually a lead role, and that while Kristen was adored by audiences and critics alike, she had already won a Tony Award. And some felt that her time for a second trophy would have to wait. From McKinley's view, he concluded that the race was ultimately between Adina and Tanya Pinkins. In Carolina Change, Pinkins played an embittered black housemaid in 1960s Louisiana. Brimming with an inner life ready to burst at any moment, Tanya Pinkett's performance was lauded and became the central talking point for a show that, in 2004, some felt was misplaced in a big commercial setting like Broadway. Ultimately, though, McKinley predicted that it would be Pinkins to take home the trophy that night. And, um, well... Adina Menzel! Now, of course, I can't really comment on how the voters ultimately went with Adina. Personally, I'd love to see how the votes were divided in this category. But it might be that Adina's dismissal by the critics may have worked in her favor. Tony voters usually attend productions following nominations, in Wicked's case, several months into the run. And even if some voters had come in knowing Kristen's critical reception, they may have been surprised at just how strongly Adina held her own, creating a complex, nuanced performance, as well as a self-empowered character that has, through the passage of time, become iconic. All of these factors may have helped tip the vote in her favor, truly establishing Adina Menzel as a Broadway star. I think at this point, most people usually associate Adina Menzel with her big vocal performances, and when we think about the role she's played, that makes sense. But constantly being expected to deliver at that level can be demanding for any performer. Edina has always been open about grappling with perfectionism and the expectations from the audience. In the years after Wicked, Edina would later admit, There's an insecurity that if I don't show that, people won't like me. Who am I if I'm not this singer with big high notes? I identify with my voice, but I'm more than just the acrobatics. Even after Edina's Tony win for Wicked, critics have at times appeared perplexed decrying the filtering of pop music entering the musical theater, which, when considering the shows that have opened on Broadway in the last few years, seems like a battle long lost. You can definitely have thoughts and opinions about mainstream music or Adina's singing style, trust me, I've heard them, but the history of backlash between pop music and the musical theater really just seems like institutionalized gatekeeping to me. And of course, it's not just from Broadway. Wicked opened Adina up to an array of opportunities, like the film adaptation of Rent, Disney's Enchanted, and ultimately, another shot at a recording contract, this time with Warner Brothers. Working with producer and co-writer Glenn Ballard, Adina sought to create a rock and roll soundscape reminiscent of Ballard's collaboration on Alanis Morissette's groundbreaking album, Jagged Little Pill. 
Much of this was vetoed by the record label, though, leaning the album into adult contemporary with glossy arrangements of grand power ballads. The subsequent album, I Stand, was released in January 2008. Following the album's release, Edina set out on a promotional tour through North America and a quick stop in the UK, where she also starred in the concert staging of the musical Chess at the Royal Albert Hall. Fans of Adina were quick to embrace I Stand, and though critics cited Adina's assured technical skill as a singer, their reception was mixed on the overall tone of the album, seemingly in contention between Broadway and pop. While I Stand fared a bit better than her first record, making its debut at number 58 on Billboard, it never gained any further traction. Edina was reportedly disappointed in the record label's overall promotion of the album, and eventually, she and Warner Brothers would part ways. Once again, Edina, a Broadway performer, found herself at odds crossing over as a serious contender in the pop world. Historically, at least in the last, say, 50 years, this has been par for the course. The last significant example of a Broadway performer crossing over is Barbara Streisand, who just happens to be one of Adina's idols. And while Broadway performers have released records of their own songs through labels like Shikaboom and Ghostlight, I talked about it in a previous episode, Adina obviously had ambitions to be heard by a larger audience. In 2010, Adina was cast in a featured role on the television show Glee. Aw, remember Glee? <laughs> I think it's fair to say the show has not, um, aged gracefully. But when it first aired, Glee was one of TV's biggest shows, noted for its regular employment of Broadway performers to its roster. So Adina's casting was quite a coup. Capitalizing on this new recognition, Adina launched a new concert tour. This time, she would be backed by a full orchestra. It's the first time I'm doing this. Usually I am I go out and I perform kind of with a five-piece rock band. And um, I've taken, you know, past tunes from um, shows that I've been in, um, songs from my pop album, some new jazz standard kind of stuff, and I had it all orchestrated for major symphonies. And, um, and, it's, and we're going to be doing like kind of summer outdoor venues. And I'm just really excited about it. It's kind of taking my music to a new level and... Um, uh, and hopefully it'll help me kind of reach a new audience as well. I think that it makes sense to go in that direction. You know, a lot of Broadway stars make a lot of their money doing orchestra gigs. You know, that, that that's sort of the, the side hustle of being a Broadway performer, because once you get a little notoriety on stage, you can get those, those gigs. So uh, to me, it felt like a very necessary step for her moving, moving forward with her audience. During this initial tour, Adina first joined forces with renowned composer Marvin Hamlish as her conductor. After hitting it off, the two would perform together several times, including engagements at the Kennedy Center, her debut solo appearance at Lincoln Center, and two performances in Toronto, which were filmed for a special presentation, Edina Menzel Live, Barefoot at the Symphony. 2013 was a big year for Adina. In January, she made her concert debut at Carnegie Hall, and the following month, it was announced that she would return to Broadway in a new original musical called If Then. With the names attached to the project, along with Adina's long-anticipated return to the Broadway stage, If Then became a hugely anticipated event. But Adina also had a movie coming out that year. In November, while If Then was out of town in Washington, D.C., Walt Disney Pictures released the animated movie Frozen, where Adina voiced the role of Queen Elsa. The film was well received, but critics were quick to recognize the power of Adina's performance in a little song called Let It Go. Written by husband and wife team Robert Lopez and Kristen Anderson Lopez, Let It Go was the first song written for the movie, shifting the entire dynamic of the original story, changing Elsa from villain to heroine. In reviewing the soundtrack, Mark Snedeker of Entertainment Weekly called Let It Go an incredible anthem of liberation, matched by the animator's spectacular visuals when she shirks her responsibilities and builds a mesmerizing crystalline palace. The song wasn't really a sleeper hit, but did gradually grow in popularity. And as many parents will tell you, especially amongst young children who played the song over and over and over again. 
As a single, Let It Go also broke into the popular music charts, reaching number five on the Billboard 100. Now, other Disney songs have appeared on this chart, but only through covers by pop artists of the day. And while Demi Lovato also laid down her own pop version of Let It Go, it was Adina's version that charted and became widely regarded, making her the first Tony Award-winning performer to appear in the top 10 Billboard charts. Frozen became, and is still, as of the publication of this video, the highest grossing animated movie of all time, going on to win Oscars for Best Animated Feature and Best Song. Speaking of the Oscars, in the middle of tech rehearsals for If Then on Broadway, Edina was flown to Los Angeles to perform Let It Go live at the Oscar ceremony. To introduce her, John Travolta took to the stage and, well, you know. Please welcome the wickedly talented one and only Adele Dazeem. John Travolta's uh, mangling of Adina's name during the Oscar ceremony was baffling, quickly stirring the internet into a frenzy and becoming one of the most talked about gaffes in Academy Awards history. At least until, you know, this happened. La La Land. John Travolta, of course, has since apologized, and the two are on friendly terms. If anything, the whole situation only benefited Adina. If you didn't know who she was before, you certainly knew now. And I must say, some of the memes and the name generators that came out of this period is truly the internet at its finest. Three days later, Adina was back in New York to start previews for If Then, written by Tom Kitt and Brian Yorkey. The show reunited Adina with Rent director Michael Greif and her co-star, Anthony Rapp. For the first time, Adina Menzel was the sole name above the title. The acclaim of Frozen and, for better or worse, the Adele Dazeem debacle finally gave Adina the popular recognition she had long worked for. At the same time, this new success found Adina during a difficult period in her life. In If Then, it would be hard not to see the parallels between the lives of Adina and the character of Elizabeth, a woman grappling with the end of a marriage, returning to New York City, literally and figuratively at a crossroads in her life. It might be unnerving to lay herself bare like that, but Adina described the experience as, quote, profound, a gift. You don't wallow in it, it's a place of reflection. It's too uncanny, but there's something there that obviously I need to look at and learn from, and that's what I intend to do. While reviews for If Then itself were mixed, Edina's performance was widely acclaimed. She would later be nominated for a Tony that year for Best Leading Actress in a Musical. And while the award ultimately went to the delightful Jesse Mueller that evening, Edina returned to Radio City Music Hall a week later to make her solo concert debut for a sold out audience. <laughs> this place is fucking huge. <laughs> Given all her success and rise to international fame, Radio City Music Hall seemed to make perfect sense. But for the girl from Long Island who once dreamed of being the opening act at this very hall, being the main attraction must have made the night all the more special. The fact that she has now established herself with the kind of career she has is, is very impressive. And it takes a lot of work to build a career like that. When, when I look at Adina's resume and sort of track her career, which I followed from the beginning. It's interesting because I saw how long it took her to sort of figure out what her place was and, and where people really wanted to appreciate her talents. The entertainment career is part luck, part talent and being in the right place at the right time and, you know, doing John Travolta screwing up your name, whatever, all these things sort of like they all build up to a career and in some ways it hasn't even all come together in that one big way yet when you really think about it i mean wicked was one of those big moments but a lot of the rest of it is sort of like piecemeal things as successful and accomplished as adina is i think that there is something else really big on the horizon. And I maybe she knows what it is. I don't, but I'm really, I can't wait to be there and to see it. But it's, it's interesting. It doesn't feel uh, complete in a lot of ways. It feels like it's still building up to something. So in this episode, I've basically outed myself as an Adina Menzel stan. For 20 years, I have followed her career and admired her talent. But as Paul alluded to earlier, 
talent is only one part in sustaining a career in show business, and it hasn't been perfect. Not every endeavor was a success. She didn't always fit the mold. She didn't always have the critics behind her. But I don't think that's ever really been part of her appeal. For me, there is an inherent quality about her that is always slightly set apart from everyone else. A quality that is often reflected in the roles that she plays. These characters are the kind that persevere against all odds, who are open to evolve while staying true to their convictions. It's all quite sentimental, really, and doesn't come close to describe the kind of grit it takes to sustain 25 years in such a volatile business. But looking through the hurdles she has faced in her career, you might recognize the affinity between Adina and those very characters. It is one of many reasons I think people root for her, and why I believe we will continue to see great things from her.